Hey there, everybody. I am going to go ahead and finish up some of this that I had done before. I've had some requests both on and offline to do a little more detail. I had previously, in my previous video, talked about, about this being my little bit of my own personal thing about um, how scientists try to describe, or what they mean, I should say, when they try to describe what they do as seeing the mind of God uh, or reading the mind of God, Einstein was my answer several others. Um, and I put this out here. I'm actually going to be a bit more bold uh, in my, in what I say, uh, even though I should, this right here is the only, only pattern that we base all human thought and representation on. That's a bold claim. And I'll show you why. This is, for those that know, this is basically saying that there's only one and all that is not one, which is true. At least, that's what we say. This is the language of math. So I'm going to go a little bit further. I have a uh, frozen custard here to do it. I had to uh, uh, get in there, but I'm going to go in a little bit. And I'm going to start this back over here on this whiteboard. So I'm going to do this again. All things. One all. There's only one all, right? There's multiverses, but there's only one group of multiverses. Whatever it is, this is it. Now we're going to say, well, let's do that. Let's use the universe. Let's use something else. I'm going to use ice cream scoops later just to illustrate. We're going to say, out of all this stuff, we're going to pick one thing, right? As soon as we do that, by making something, we also make it negative. Or more appropriately, it's opposite. We're going to sit here and say this. Not only do we have that, but because the things that make this, if you say, quite literally, all of the things that make this negated or the opposite of anything that makes this up. Let's say it's helium. What's the opposite of helium? It's everything that's not helium. Well, okay, well, in this specific, that's all the rest of it. So we got this one thing and all the rest. But now we're going to say exactly, specifically, only exactly opposite of helium. Oh, well, that's this one. Okay, so, and then we have another helium over here. So we have this little bit, and then we have this. These are opposites, these are the same. And then we have this little thing over here I'm going to represent with a square. Say, something else that's neither. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what? Well, let me do it with Ice cream. A couple of things I like about ice cream. One, it's freaking ice cream. How can you not like that? Yes, this is cold brewed chocolate chip frozen custard. And yeah, it's Tillamook. Oregon. It's not only uh, U.S. made, it is West Coast, so it's close to me. Uh, another cool thing about ice cream is it is a state-dependent thing. If you let ice cream melt and then refreeze it, you do not get ice cream back. You get frozen whatever that cream stuff is. You have to remake it. Let me repeat that. Whatever you do to this, when it melts, you have to remake it. You have to redo it. There are several state-dependent things like this. Coffee is another one. You let coffee cool down to the point where the oil separates, and you cannot redo, re-establish the oil um, dispersion within the fluid um, once it has cooled down. Once that oil co coalesces, it doesn't go back in, and if you try and cook it, you just, uh, well, make burnt coffee. Several other things, hardened steel, tempered steel, all that sort of stuff. But we're going to do this with ice cream. So here we go. One scoop. I'm going to try and make this as evenly as possible. My scoop. So I just took a scoop. Here is the empty part of that scoop. Let me just make this clear. I took a scoop. I made two things. I made the hole and the scoop. Let me make that clear. This is why it's an illustrative point for me. I took one, but I made two things. Now, that's that right there. I took one and made a hole. Now, let's do another one. I'm gonna make one just like the other one. You know how I know it's equal? Because it fits in the darn hole. Doesn't fit exactly, because this is ice cream and everything's not perfect. But I can essentially Swap these two out, and they fit in the same hole. 
there's a little bit difference. We're ignoring the fact that I probably cut some chocolate chips. It's not exactly great. The top isn't exactly clean. We're assuming that, it, that I was perfect in my scoop for this particular example. So these two are equal. They're equal because they fit into each other's holes. That's how you can tell. It's like, how do you tell? Well, they're exactly the same. Well, how do you know that there isn't something you're missing? You put it in the negative, right? You put it in the negative. Now, if I had another ice cream to illustrate this again, so I have two that are the same, I have two that are the opposite, and all four of them are equal. Let's just make that clear. These are all equal. One's just opposite. So that, that might sound like just, oh, that's kid stuff, but that's quite profound. They are equal, but opposite, and you can swap them around to make sure they're okay. And then if I had a square one or a different sort of thing, I could establish this. What makes these two things? What's different about them? Well, these two are obviously do something that the other one can't. You can make a whole sphere out of these two scoops, right? So these are parts of something else. The holes in this negative, you could essentially form a negative ball. Ooh, this is starting to stick because it's getting wet. I may have to eat that one. Mm. Tastes like cold brew chocolate chip. Uh, these two are different, but they are equal. We absolutely know it. There's... We talk about signs, there's all sorts of stuff you can use to describe it. We use these things on there, but this is essentially one and negative one. The whole, the emptiness of one, and the one that comes with it, they are equal, but obviously different. <laughs> on a different dimensional level, they're different. But on certain dimensional levels, they are equal. And we get another one, we get two, we can get three, I can get a third scoop in here, right? I can get a fourth scoop. And we have all the same, for every one that I make, I make, I got two, I got, in order to make two, I make two holes. So that always happens. Two of the same, two of the opposite, and they're equal. And then there's something like a square, I don't have another thing, ice cream, because I am lactose intolerant, so that little bit of scoop I got is probably about all I'm gonna be able to eat. I'm lightly lactose intolerant, I can tolerate some. Uh, the square would be another ice cream you put in here. It is neither, the, it won't fit in the hole. It's not the same color, it's not the same thing. It may not be, it'll be square. It's not the same. And it won't fit in the hole and it won't match up with the other. This is a rough example of what it is. This is whole ones. I'm, I'm using half scoops to put them together, make two and all that stuff. But we're using this as an example of whole ones. Things that are wholly one. Holy one, well, this is a cap, so it's not, but it's a one cap, right? You're starting to get some of the feel of this. So any of this stuff can go in. This is the entire one, right? This is the basis of one. There's actually, for anyone who's, I'm using very, very reductionist type terms, and I'm definitely not being rigor, or I'm not using rigor, and I'm not being very rigorous to really properly get those uh, things out there. Um, but I am doing it much more on principle, and I will try and keep it without using the language of rigor, still using rigor in how I do it to a certain extent. So uh, while, without, while I'm establishing things like N and all this other stuff, I'm establishing there's two things that are equal. If I can put this over here, if this one is equal, and this one is equal, and this one is equal, I could drop this in here. This cannot take the place of this or this and vice versa. This can be taken up by neither. Now I'm going to get to one that are, that are more important. First of all, let's establish one thing. The difference between one um, to zero, or essentially between one, oops, this one. Uh, I'm doing that wrong, sorry. Anyway. From one to negative one, there's a bigger infinity than from zero to infinity. Let's establish that first. That's, you can go all over the internet and do that. There's several things that, uh, oh my goodness. 
Um, why, I, why I'm forgetting is the mathematician's name that did that. He also proved that uh, mathematics was not complete and all that sort of stuff. He, he established this uh, as comparing infinities, and I believe it was a diagonal proof and stuff like that. Without going into that, I'm just establishing that right in there. So we understand that there is a bigger infinity between these than there is outside of it. Or more importantly, the one that is also all that is not one is the biggest infinity. Just, that's a stretch. So it takes a little bit of maneuvering to get there, but I'm going to establish it anyway. That the infinity that goes past one is smaller and therefore secondary. Doesn't mean that it is. There's a way to get around. There's other large infinities and all that sort of stuff. I would... Transcendentals and all that. Anyway, to get to it, let's talk about the things that aren't one. Or, or to put it in another thing, the root of one. Or what we like to say is square root of negative one. This is also known as I in mathematical circles. I, this is something that I write. The root of what it, of all that is not one. Let's think about that for a second. The root of all that is not one. Let's try that one. Let's try that definition because it's far better. I am not going to continue using ice cream for this, so hopefully it won't melt if I can get this done fast enough. I am going to use the example of, let's say, a tree. Not, and it has a little leaf on it. All right, one little leaf. This is this is this this is our story of the leaf. Now we call this one. We call this a leaf. We say it is a leaf. So let's try and define that real, real solid. Like, well, it's a structure. It's got this. It's got a stem. Okay. So when can you differentiate this from the stem? And I mean non-arbitrarily. I can differentiate this pin from other pins by space. I can differentiate this whiteboard from other whiteboards by space. I can differentiate this leaf from other leaves by space. How can I differentiate this leaf from the tree? Because there's a structure somewhere in here. Because when it falls off, we have a leaf right here that's dead. Right? So the only way we can really tell when it's completely a leaf is when it's no longer alive. When it's not completely a leaf. Or more appropriately, when it's no longer attached to things. We still call it a leaf when it's here. We don't we call it a leaf even when it's in its little budding stage. We got this little bit like here, we'll have this little bud and a little tiny leaf coming out. Well, that's a baby leaf. But where does the stem stop? Another one will grow, I understand. And we can find structures that say, oh, this is a structure. But when is that structure not a part of the branch? When is this leaf only a leaf? When it falls and dies. It's on the ground. But then it's not, it's a dead leaf. We know it's different. It's the same, but different, right? The only time this thing is ever completely itself is when it's not when it's gone, when it's not living and doing and performing functions and being part of a system. So this thing never really does. It almost reaches it. Let's say when it's just a growth node, right? And I'm going to do something really strange. I'm going to put this in a graph because this will be interesting. And we'll say right here, we're going to do something real. We'll say this is, this is a whole leaf and this is a completely not leaf. Okay, we'll say completely not leaf. We'll just go down here. Or we'll start at no structures, right? We'll start at the beginning. The tree's growing up and it's going. We got this branch, we have a branch. It's not completely not leaf, it's not there. We have a leaf. We have a bud that starts to grow. This is not a complete analogy because really where you start is harder. But it really doesn't matter. It's really just a matter of phase separation, which on this little particular cycle 
is a phase separation. So we'll just start out at a branch, at a completely not one state, right? We'll go here. Now, as that leaf grows, as that bud develops, it starts to branch out. It's not really a branch when it starts to get that little green popping out, but it's not a leaf either, right? It's neither. It's, it's not really both, but something's coming. Now, as that thing grows and it comes up, and I'm going to not quite reach that one because it's still a branch. Still, I mean, the stem of a leaf looks an awful like a branch. It's hard to tell the difference unless there's a growth thing, especially from the outside. We don't quite reach completely not leaf. It's a branch. It's still a lot like a tree. It's a part of the tree. And right here, it's still a part of the tree. So it's coming up. It's coming up to the top. This is a fully matured and moving leaf. But you still can't fully differentiate it from the tree. You can find a arbitrary, you say this is the growth structure that goes in there and it must be. But that growth structure, when do, and so that growth structure ends and it's embedded somewhere within the wood that you only find when it starts to develop and somewhere it starts to grow. So it never fully gets to one. And then it dies and it's almost, almost a one, like 0.99, it's like 99.9999% at either. When it's fully growing, growing, it's almost gone, it's almost a complete leaf, but it's still attached. And once it detaches and leaf has its own thing, it's still almost a leaf, but it's not alive doing all that other stuff. It's, it's starting to go into a different phase. It's now dying, right? And it comes off the tree. It's almost a leaf, but as it goes and it starts to decay, comes down and it starts, it, we, you can see pieces of leaves on the ground and be like, oh, that's almost a dead leaf, right? That's almost a leaf. It's starting to get to be where it's, just dirt. And pretty soon you're like, oh, well, that's just dirt. Right? Oh, that's just dirt. Oh, that's just dirt. Okay. So that's just dirt. But now that dirt's getting broken down by microorganisms. The rain washes it down. It starts to become nutrients. It's nothing. It's not even close to a leaf. And then it gets uptake by the tree and starts to move through the tree. And it almost becomes never a leaf again. But then it's, since it's fallen right under the tree, it breaks down the nutrients go back to the tree and it starts going up there and it starts the new cycle of growth as it works up as we started over here and ad infinitum repeat everyone's like yeah so well what if we decide we want to pick this part where it's just starting to grow and so it's like okay just at the start of growth just at the start of the bud formation the node growth we're going to start there I'm going to do the same thing without talking you through it all right and you can actually start this at any phase and do it. This is a cyclical model of something that is never quite one except for arbitrarily, only if you take it out of its frame of reference. Let me make that clear. So we have something that's one and we can get an opposite, a leaf and not a leaf, right? Ice cream scoop and the whole. All sorts of stuff like that. There's, there's way, they're just analogies, but I'm trying to get the concept across. This right here, this cycle, at any point in time, all of the parts can or can't be. And it is the root of what is not one. There's a reality part to it. And then there's the imaginary arbitrary part of where we decide where this is cut off. If anyone has any uh questions about that we'll just sit here and say well there's the real part we'll just even say that's the tree right we'll call that a tree right and we'll just say this is b leaf <laughs> I like that little play on words. So in order to really get this whole thing together, to summarize all this, we're going to sit here and say like, well, let's take a look at the tree. Okay. So the tree has to be a part of it, right? We can't have the leaf without a tree isn't a full leaf. It came from somewhere. So the tree is a solid part. We'll do a, the tree. Well, plus the leaf, right? It's an arbitrary, but the, the leaf is a real thing, but where it stops is arbitrary. So we need the leaf. And since it's not quite one, we said this is I, the leaf 
times that imaginary part that is the cycle. And then we're looking at going like, well, depending upon the way we look at it, well, this could be A plus the leaf or A minus the leaf. So we'll just do plus and minus the leaf and its imaginary, um, well, arbitrary cutoff point. Um, the pieces that make this up, this is just small. And by the way, this is the real part plus that, that is actually the definition of the square root of negative one. Um, in this regime, not this, though it does come out the same. The square root of all that is not one? Well, the root of all that is not one is either everything that's in there, that's all the pieces, and you look at it in one piece, the leaf, the parts, all that stuff, or in here, the root of all that is not one is this. It's the same, it's something real, real plus the cycle. Where does it start? It comes through, it's never quite, it kisses. These things almost get to one and they almost get to not one and parts of them do, but it never quite matches. This is an analogy to establish the principle. I'm using it as an example. There's probably far greater rigorous ways to do this, but I'm using it as an explanatory example. Here's the other thing that's going to that's gonna be a part of this, and this is going to be weird for some people. Please excuse me for jumping in front of the camera. I forgot the eraser part. This is what's going to be hard for a lot of people right here. So here's the other thing, and this is understanding that this is a composite, right? Look at that here. This is a composite. That leaf is part tree, part dirt, part air. It is a composite. Not only that, but when you get into higher things, this will always be that way. You sit there and say, well, it's not one. You know, we need to look at this bigger system. Well, it's, well, let's just look at something. We'll, we'll, we'll do a different one. Something that's, we'll do a desk. Or since there's a chair right there in front of the chair. We got the, we got the base of the chair, right? The base of the chair. We got the seat of the chair, the, um, well, we'll say the back, but I don't want to do that. We'll just say the vertical part of the chair, the vertical back of the chair. Um, and many other pieces. So the, there's the back, there's the seat, there's the support from the or from there. There's the uh, feet of the chair, right? Um, and then there's what connects them. There's the, there's the connecting pieces of all these. So we'll just say plus that connects them, plus that connects them, plus that connects them equals one. Every solution in math will take on this. It will be one of these. We'll either composite it and use all these other things to go in there so that we can use it to solve an equation, say either these two are equal or opposite in some way, or we will find out, or we'll prove that it's not those, so it's something else. Every single Solution in math when applied to reality will fit this pattern. It's a matter of making it into one. When we start looking downward into cycles, like, well, we don't want to do composites. We don't want to talk about how things are cells and us. If we want to find the indivisible part, the atomos of the world or the universe, what? is the, the indivisible part, the things that aren't composites. And you know what? When we start looking, there isn't. There isn't. Because here's the thing. When we've got one and all that is not one, we're measuring stuff with stuff from inside here. That's the root of the measurement problem. It's like saying, well, how tall are you? I'm 88 left thumbs tall. The how long is your... There's no outside thing. We try and find constants. We try and things, find things like the speed of light, um, the permissivity of free space. There's, we find things that we call universal constants. And then we try and use those to measure. Speed of light, most common. That's what we use for distance. 
That's what we use for distance. Solid vibrations of things like, I don't know, quartz crystals, or what we use for time, atomic cesium atoms and how they do it, regardless. And uh, things like once they move out of the well, it doesn't, it, sorry, I'm going into gravity and well stuff like that. We don't need it. Um, just to get back to it. All of these things break down to, can we get in there? No. Atoms, oh no, there's really a, there's, there's really a nucleus and then there's electron shells and they're not really there and electrons are kind of there but they don't really exist all on their own. They have anti, there's a particle and it's anti-particle, there's symmetry that goes there. All this stuff is such things. Then we start bringing back, it's like, well, is that really all there is? We can do all that, but there's weird stuff. Well, then we find quarks. But quarks don't really like to live alone. They're not really one without being part of something more. Um, they break down. They change. They don't, they change into something else. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things. But honestly, this is the thing. You want to do a representation? Find me a representation that doesn't have to do with taking something higher and putting it in a hierarchical or a categorical nature and turning it into something you can call one by putting a name on it. All things that are quartz. All things that are pens. All things that are. You start doing it hierarchical in a set manner and you make it into a single thing that you can work with by making it a composite. And when we start working downward and we try and find the things, well, we want to find a theory of everything. We go down, 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 down. We find smaller, 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 and smaller things. things. We find out there's still composites. There's still one and not one. That pattern still holds true. Find me a representation. Everyone's interpretation of representation, yeah, you know what? You're still inside this. You're never going to be outside of this. Your perspective is inside of this, always. The only thing you will know about perspective is whether you're in this group, this group, or something else. You want to talk about, I am going to represent this, right? Oh, no, I better not do that. I'm going to, well, yeah, I, oh, goodness. I, <laughs> I can't, I'm terrible at these. Uh, I don't want to do hieroglyphics or any of the wonderful, uh, like, uh, patch blue ribbon uh, under cap things. But you do a phonetic thing. You try and make it into something. You try and do all this stuff to try and put it in. It, it's all ends up going to you. It's a representation. You sit there and say, well, that looks kind of like a mountain to me. What percentage or what amount of composite of something can you leave, can you take out or leave in and still have someone see it as that one thing or that one group of things? A group of things that is one group, right? We break everything down to ones. There is no other pattern we know. I would wager that there is no other pattern humanity can understand directly this is our basis of proof this is things not things and the, that which connects them that's it all of it that is how we humans attach everything. Art. Is that a cloud? Does that look like a face to you? Well, it kind of does. Well, if you want to, what kind of percentage? You know, we, we try and find it, but as we try and catalog the universe or our experience of it this way, that's all we're doing. That's what we're doing now. We're saying, here's our knowledge and we're going to categorize it this way. This is the basis for representation. It's 70% of face. The cloud really is only about 60% of face, but man, we look at it and we see a lot of face. That bias is still. There's a certain amount of it that some people may see. Some, it's not complete. It doesn't look exactly like a face. It's not exactly one. It's just kind of like it. It's a composite. Everything. Artistic representation, mathematical solutions, and the human experience is based upon this. The grouping of all things that are one and all things that are not one into their categorical. That is how our minds work. It's just a concept whether you take an eye. It's the primary concept. <laughs> Self-reference. Um, it's built into our language. A horse or anything. It's a thing. It's a different kind of thing that we're just trying to catalog it with a different name. Well, we know that there's a rock. We know that there's 
water. It's just a bunch of little dots. We got water, right? We got rock. We got air. Let's <coughs> different things. And then we categorize them this way. We compartmentalize and categorize based upon the pattern of all things that are, in smaller cases, that one, and all things that are not that one. That's it. Everything we do is on it. You want to know why? Define a word. You have to define it specifically so that it becomes that one thing. If you leave it vague, it's a composite. Well, it's pretty vague, so how much percentage is actually included? That's a very valid thing because that's why we like rigor in science. So we know exactly what we're talking about. You want to be vague? Go ahead. But you're vague because it's only a light percentage and your numbers won't work and you don't know what you're talking about. You might. I mean, I'm here doing it. But generally speaking, that's rigor. If I sit here and say, well, all things do that. Well, no, they don't. I bet you you can find something. I'm pretty sure that if you use possibility as real energy, and you say all things can, possibilities come out and say, well, we got this one little thing over here that's not quite like that. I say possibilities are real energy because as we look through and we do that, we try and find the possibilities and we try and see which ones are there, which ones have the best energy state, which ones have the most coalesced possibility states. And that's what we like to term probability and all that sort of stuff. But uh, anyway, I have gone through. I am going to stop right there. The ice cream, leaf, ice cream scoop, scoop hole, same scoop, different scoop, tree, leaf that is, uh, as soon as it becomes a fully first leaf and is really true, it dies and falls off. Cyclical. Cyclical that never quite becomes the full one thing that it is. And I'm using the leaf as a, there's several more. It's just an example. This thing that it goes up and it has these phase changes and it almost becomes one and goes down and moves through. That is the real thing. This is a conceptual example, the ice cream scoops. Make it easy to understand the scoop and what, what you're talking about. It's not the only thing. Everything's like that. You want to talk about this? Let's, we can talk about the atom as a scoop and what it's made out of it. You know, it's made out of the electron and it's made out of the proton and the neutron. And those are made up of quarks, right? Well, electron is a quark. This is made up of three quarks. This is made up of three quarks. That's what the atom's made up of. It's like, well, yeah, it's a composite. Even an atom is a composite. It's a one atom made up of three things that are often made up of three things too. So this is where the origin of the Trinity is. Whenever you make one, just like a scoop, whenever you make one, gonna do this again, one. I also, because I like I pulled the scoop, I make the whole. What makes them together? The characteristics that define them. If you take one, there's three things there, always. That which it is, all, that which it is not, and that which connects them. That's the three in one, the trinity that leads to a particular type of infinity. Anyways, that's my assessment right there. I went on a little bit longer than I had intended to. I'm a little bit over 30 minutes. I wanted to keep it below, but that's all right. This is a little bit more detailed than I wanted to go in in my previous venture right here where I had gone over this, where we talked about one, negative one. And this is where we sit here and say, all right, if we were talking about the ice cream. I'm going to deal with this. I have the scoop. I had it moved out. I have the hole. I have two separate things. If I put that scoop back in the hole, I get neither. Let me repeat that. If I make one and I have its opposite and I put that one back in the opposite, I get zero back. I get nothing back. Doesn't matter if you multiply or what. That just to establish that real quick, that's the bump from one is equal to all that is not one to one plus that which is the opposite of one to zero. But really the way you say this is 
that the one thing and all of the characteristics that make it that one thing plus the opposite of all of the characteristics that make that one equals no difference. Okay, in case you're wondering about this, this can also be written as one minus one equals zero, and there's no difference. Technically, that's called a difference. Um, but yeah, so there we go. That's that's the jump to there. That's the bump to there. This is the examples. I did make a promise to someone that I would use both ice cream and a leaf, so I did. Uh, Vanya, that one's for you. Uh, but uh, yeah, the rest of this, there's the more detailed example of what is the only pattern that humans understand we can find more one things but it is all within this bigger framework of all that is one and all that is not one if you can tell me anything you can understand that doesn't fit these patterns by all means establish it that it doesn't do that the only thing that comes close is transcendental numbers and almost every single one of those is derived by a process in order to get it. You're going to have interactions between different items that are put together using things like add, subtract, and all these. What we talk about, like you either put them together, they come apart. You can represent it. You know, there's multiple sets of them. You can represent all of these operators with actual physical things. So you start interacting them, and then you'll get transcendental. There is, and let me be clear, there is no transcendental number. That isn't the result of a process. I'll repeat that. There's no transcendental number that isn't the product of a process. And it requires composite things. You can tell me, oh, square root of two. Okay. Anything that's not one is a composite. And even as we can show, even one is a composite in multiple instances. It is a concept. So anyway, there's that. There's my logic behind it. I encourage anyone to come up in, uh, in the comments. Anyway, please, if you like this, like, subscribe, throw a comment out. Put something there. Throw something out there in the comments. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you see. Let me know how you feel about what I just said and how it applies to you. Um, in the meantime, hey, I'm Andrew. This is a dose of Drew. There's some of my thoughts I haven't really put out there in anywhere. Um, as far as I know, this is the uh, this is my first establishment of that as when I like I said, this is the basis for all human thought representation and really any of the solutions we have are going to be like this. You going to represent it? It's going to be represented as a cycle, composite, or it is going to be its own own unique thing. That's it. That's all we got. You can do cycles equations this thing is equal to that so you know you can move it that's that's all it is it's these it's those simples it's it's that i don't want to say basic but that's what it is that's all we have is one and all that is not one we like to trap ourselves in this just the negation to avoid the infinity but all that is not one is really what it means you pick one thing out everything else in the universe is all the rest Slightly smaller, all that is not one, is slightly smaller than one simply because you plucked a little piece out. Quite honestly, if you try and look at it from outside, even though we can't, if you're, if you're looking at something that you're not a part of, it's, whether it's there or not, it's all the same to you. Anyway, that's a bit on perspective. The real truth is it's whether or not you're inside or outside. And that's it. That's the only perspective that's necessary. If you're talking about one being equal to all that is not one, okay, everything but me. Whole universe but me. Ooh, the one thing that says the universe, that's almost, wow, that's almost devilish right there. Anyway, I keep saying I'm going to do this. I'm probably close to 40 minutes now. There it is. I used one pin on this instead of the colors. I just went for the straight black. I hope that was useful to someone. I got this out. I'm going to go ahead and post this again. I'm Andrew. This is a dose of Drew. Watch this twice. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, comment in the morning.
Come on back for another one. Thank you, everybody.